Hey guys, it's me, Dean Miller, the dog counselor. And as you can see, no, stay up there. Just as I started, the guys start to come down. These are my puppies, Penny and Flip. I don't know how long they'll stay. In fact, let me, let me adjust the camera just a little bit, make sure it's up a little bit more so you can see better. That is, these are my brother and sister dogs. Let me get down here so you can see them. This is Penny, this is Flip. Penny and Flip. So, they're brother and sister. I found them in the street. Uh, actually, my sister and I found them in San Antonio, Texas, running down the street. They were about three and a half months old, and um, they were running down the street together. You can see they're inseparable. They cannot stand to be away from each other. They, in fact, they panic when they're away from each other. They're really what's called a bonded pair. If anybody out there who's familiar with a bonded pair, that is you know, any kind of animal, but dogs create these bonded pairs, and these guys are certainly a brother and sister who you can tell belong together. Um, I believe, we talked about this last week on last week's episode, I think this is episode six, I may be confused on the um, on the numbers, but we talked about this uh, last week, I think they're part Rhodesian Ridgeback, because they have a line down the middle of their back, a Rhodesian Ridgeback will have fur down the middle of their back that grows against the grain of the fur, so if a dog's fur grows backwards, one line down their spine will grow forward uh, the opposite direction. So I believe these guys are that because they have this faint line down their spine that's different. It doesn't grow the opposite direction, but it's certainly discolored from the rest of their fur. And their knuckles on their um, feet look like a Rhodesian Ridgeback. Rhodesian Ridgebacks have these kind of pronounced different looking knuckles and they certainly look like that. A Rhodesian Ridgeback was bred to hunt lions, and so they protect and uh, hunt lions, and they have a lot of stamina, and they run like crazy, and I can attest to the fact that these guys run like crazy, because this guy, Flip, is obsessed with escape, and he will escape, and his sister will follow him. Good boy, Flip. Thank you for settling down. Flip is the more mild-mannered, the more obedient. Penny is the more mischievous, crazy. I call her Lucille Ball. Um, but what's strange is Flip is the one obsessed with escape. So he will dig out, he's terrified of storms, terrified of fireworks, and on the 4th of July, boy, did he take off. And his sister followed, and they, uh, it's, I mean, just insane, insane. And as a dog trainer, I can tell you that um, you can train your dogs to consistently come to you, consistently obey you, consistently listen to you. But there's always that day, that day when a firework goes off, that day when a car backfires, that day when there's a squirrel or a rabbit or something and that dog just, all training goes out the window. There's an old saying, there's no knowledge behind instinct. Instinct just takes over and boom, they're gone. So that happened on the 4th of July. Luckily I got them back. Luckily after they clear their heads and aren't so crazy, they do come back to me. I think they do love their dad. I really believe they do. Let me adjust this so you can see it a little bit better. This is our Wolf Driver logo. I think I had it a little bright. If you're familiar with Wolf Driver, uh, he is. If the, this is the channel named after the Wolf Driver. The Wolf Driver is the guy that you see here all the time in his cart with his, uh, or various carts with his dogs, and they pull him, and he travels in this uh, Wolf Driver cart. And he started this whole channel, Bill Hellman, and uh, he started this whole channel. And he asked me to be a part of it, and I'm forever grateful for that because I really enjoy talking to you guys about what I know about dogs. I love answering your questions, and I find that each time I do these episodes, I learn something myself. So it's been really good for my training. It's been really good for me to do this, and I really enjoy it. My name is Dean Miller, and I am known as the dog counselor. Uh, I counsel people about their dogs. I go to your home and I talk to you about um, your dog and you know basically what's going on with your dog. Um, and I, I do in-home sessions, which I believe a dog learns much better at home than they do um, in a class because that's their own territory. That's where they're most comfortable. And if you can learn in your own home, it's pretty ideal. I'm trying to stay out of the way of the dogs, but still stay on camera so you can see the cute dogs instead of my ugly mug. But um, anyway, um, we're getting some some guests writing in and some some people sending little thumbs ups and hearts and stuff, and I love that. It, ma it makes me know that somebody's actually listening to my rambling. Let's see what people have to say. I have to actually take these glasses off and get up on the screen when I want to see what people are saying. So let me walk, look up here. Um, 
Kim Villanueva uh, says, I hope I'm saying that right, so you know, I guess it would be either Villanueva or Villanueva, but Kim says, I'm having issues about my boy Bruce. He's a great dog. That doesn't sound like issues to me. That sounds like he's a great dog, but maybe you can let, let us know what those issues are. Um, hi from Cincinnati, and then this is Chucky. Hello, I'm getting a lot of hellos. But if you have any real like comments or um, questions or anything, I'd love to answer them. I'd love to talk to you. Oh, here we go, here's Kim. He has anxiety. He will circle the house. You know, that is really strange that you came up with that question because I just left the house where a dog had anxiety. And what that dog was doing was um, the, the anxiety was manifesting itself in a way where the dog would stare at reflective things, um, stare at shadows, fixate. Um, I've seen dogs lick the floor and pace the floor. Um, and, and it's really um, difficult to fix if you don't know the wiring of a dog. Dogs are wired differently up here than humans are. And humans have this instinct to want to say, it's okay, it's all right, everything's okay, don't worry. And dogs respond very much to tone of voice and attitude. And so when a dog is having anxiety or stress and you say, it's okay, it's okay, um, that tone sounds exactly like, good girl, good boy, it's okay, it's okay. And so in essence, they take that as nurturing or, or affection or love. And so if a dog is in an anxious state of mind and you're saying, it's okay, it's okay, they're, they're, they're taking it as you're saying, I love it when you're stressed, could you be more stressed? And my suggestion is finding a mild interruption to the anxiety. So you want to correct it, but in a mild way. If you correct in a, in a higher level way, um, you're going to cause more anxiety. So for example, the dog is pacing and walking and you say, no. And if you say it gently, no or you touch them, you kind of touch them with your finger, maybe on the shoulder or something to snap them out of it, that's a gentle correction. If you say, no, they're gonna really hit the roof with more anxiety and do the behavior more. But a gentle, hey, snap out of it, no. And then when they snap out of it for a minute, you praise, you, that's when you gently and quietly praise. You don't wanna say, oh, good dog, because it just cranks it up again. The, the pattern is, no, and then good, good puppy, good puppy. And so um, you want to interrupt, correct a little bit, and then praise quietly and calmly. Now that's a really over, that's an oversimplification, and I don't want to say that that's true for all dogs because every dog is different. Every dog has a different kind of um, approach. So if you want to talk further about this, I do phone consultations, Skype consultations. If you want to contact me through my website, thedogcounselor.com, I would be happy to discuss this with you. And, um, and we can work further. I also do in-home visits. I travel. I go all over the country. I've gone all kinds of places to train dogs, and I'd love to help you with yours. So let me look at more comments. I'm having an issue here on the screen, which is I don't have the, uh, the time up here. So I don't know how long my show is going to be. So I may have to go back here and check the time on the computer or something, um, or somebody tell me when I'm coming up on 30 minutes. But um, let me look at at some of the com comments and questions here. Let's see what we've got here. Um, I don't know what that means. Hello from Waterford, Michigan. Hello, Kelly. Uh, I try to comment a pic of my dog, Chucky. Okay, well, I don't see that pic, so I don't know what that means. Um, yes, people don't use common sense a lot of the time, and they need someone to give them good advice, and that is true. That is true. A lot of people don't use common sense, and they don't think in terms of a dog being wired differently from, the, from a human. A dog is wired differently from a human being, okay? My dog Kirby's over here whining because he wants my attention. Kirby, hush. Shh. I'll be with you in a minute. Thank you. Okay. Um, hello from Richmond. Hello, Teresa. And um, let's see here. Okay. Rochelle says, my diesel is very loving, but anyone that touches his fence will get bit. Well, you have a very protective dog. And oftentimes what happens is we inadvertently make our dogs, um, we make them our security guards. And so um, I'm... I, it, it, you know, there's a lot that leads up to why a dog feels protective of their own space. Um, and it's good to have a dog that barks or warns you and lets you know someone's there.
But if a dog is attacking or biting through the fence, that can be a liability, it can be a danger. It can be a danger to your dog. If someone um, gets hurt by your dog, a person can often, um, I mean the city or the county can take your dog away for hurting someone. So I always suggest that you get enough training to have control of your dog so that you don't have a liability, someone doesn't get hurt. I'd hate for a child to reach through your fence. Um, you know, if you decide you want some training in that direction, I can certainly help with that. So let me see here. Uh, now someone's at my door. Hold on, guys. Now someone's at my door, and uh, and I, I can't answer it right now. Hush, guys. Hush, hush. Okay. So um, let's see here. Dogs don't like thunder. Let's see here what this says. Dogs don't like thunder. How can we calm them? Um, there are many, many ways to uh, calm a dog. Um, with, with uh, thunder, but thunder and thunderstorms are often the hardest things to correct because the thunderstorm is out there and we're down here and the dog can't see us control. So um, if they can't see us controlling the situation, then they can't, um, you know, they can't know that we're in charge. So that becomes uh, a big problem for us. Um, there are many situations, again, with the uh, it's okay, it's okay. We don't want to praise and say it's okay, it's okay. Um, so we don't want to constantly do that because when we do that, that is like telling the dog, good dog, be scared of the thorn storm. I like it when you're scared. And we can't you know, imply that uh, we like it when they're scared. Uh, we want to say, the, the attitude we want to convey when a dog is afraid of a storm or fireworks is more a, a, a position of strength. Okay, so we want to convey that we're strong. We want to, if I can get Henry to come here. Henry, you want to come here and show us? You want to help us? Come here. Henry, come here. Come here, buddy. Henry, come up here. Good boy. Henry's going to help me. I'm going to let you, I'm going to show you Henry. This is Henry's backside. There's Henry. Uh, right here, right here. Stop. Right here, buddy. So when a dog is afraid and you're saying, it's okay, it's okay, they're taking that as praise and affection. Okay? So when a dog is in, a, in an upset state of mind, you don't want to be giving affection and praise because they take it as you t encouraging that feeling. If a dog's afraid or scared, I want to have this attitude of strength. I want to say, hey, you're fine. I want a, a slight amount of pressure, you know, like hugging somebody or like holding somebody or like if you gripped the child's hand and said, I got you. The attitude we want to convey to a dog is, I got you. You see, I got you. I'm holding on to you, you're fine. It's, uh, it's the same principle as a thunder shirt, which puts a little bit of pressure around a dog, a hug, a little bit of pressure. That's okay, Henry, you can go. Thank you. Uh, thank you, buddy, for helping me. Um, oh, you want to help? Flip wants to help, too. Okay, so anyway, um, it's the principle of a thunder shirt, which is put a little bit of pressure or a hug on. Um, it's the same principle. They use this with animals a lot. They use it with cattle in cattle shoots. When they go in a shoot and they're going to do shots or medical work or castration on a cattle, they'll put them in a chute and that chute puts pressure on the sides of the cow and the cow will relax. Uh, same principle, animals often relax when you put a little bit of firm pressure, uh, not hard, not hard, just a, like a hug, okay, or a firm handshake. And um, they, they, they use this technique with autistic children as well. Oftentimes an autistic child can be out of control or can't be reached or can't be, um, you know, um, they, they can't reach them with, with words. So a hug kind of comforts them and makes them relax and helps the, helps the body relax and helps them feel calm. So I, those are some suggestions for a storm. They're not always 100% flip. As I said, one of my dogs is terrified of storms and nothing can console him. Um, the best possible thing is to give them a place to escape and relax and just wait it out. If they like going under the bed, if they like a certain spot in a room, if they like to go somewhere, well then by all means, let them have access to that. So let me look up on here and see what else we got. We got Hello Cute Doggy from Amira. Hi, Amira. Hi, Lynette. Do um, let's see. Oh, Lynette is whose question I just asked, answered. Um, my son's dog is half breed and he's a handful. Well, I can't help with that unless I know what the problem is, but I'd be happy to help if you want to write to me or call me. Uh, my puppies are nine months old. They will not stay in the yard. We've even put up a six-foot privacy fence. They still scale it to run around the neighborhood. I do not want to go to shot collars. Do not want them to be hit by a car either. Okay, I agree with you. I know what you're saying. I have my dogs escape too. Um, I've had to resort to areas of my fence that are vulnerable. They have cinder blocks at the bottom. That's how severe it is with my uh, escape dogs, okay? Um, but something you might consider at the top of your fence you might consider 
a, a some kind of wire at the top and angling it inward. You know, curving it inward, angling it inward, some kind of something at the top that angles inward so that the dog can't scale it. So that may be something you want to consider, is, is angling your fence from the top or adding, you know, a section of wire at the top that is, um, that is angled inward. Okay, now let me see here. Help to stop nipping. Okay, we've talked about nipping in previous episodes, but um, let me talk about this. Um, oftentimes the biggest mistake in nipping, especially in puppies, is as they're mouthing, we're withdrawing our hand. We're saying, ow, quit, no. And any withdrawal or moving back is a submissive move. It's a, it's a weaker move. It's not a dominant move. Forward is dominant, back is submissive. Also, movement creates, um, first of all, prey drive. They'll chase that movement. Secondly, um, movement makes it like a game. So what a dog would do is if a dog was nipping and the dog didn't like it, that dog will go and they'll bite and move forward and then they'll hold their position. That holding their position is kind of like saying to the puppy, I dare you. It's like saying, I'm not moving, you move. So when we correct, if we'll leave our hand there, correct with the other hand with a touch, like to the shoulder or to the, you know, somewhere that doesn't hurt the dog, the shoulder or the side, but just a touch, not a, you know, an, an assertive touch that doesn't hurt. So the dog's mouthing here, you say no and then leave that hand motionless. And you'll watch the dog withdraw and then come back usually with a lick or something more submissive. Sometimes it takes one or two corrections, nothing harsh, nothing hard, but by leaving that hand still, the dog learns to accommodate and be more soft-mouthed on the, on the hand. So that's, that's my tip for that, and I can show you more in detail if you decide to have me do a Skype conference or come to your house. I do all of those things. So let me see here. Uh, I don't know what that means. Uh, oh. Oh, I see. Your, your, your dog, you're saying that, okay, Kim says, um, my dog wants me to stop exactly what I'm doing at that moment and go outside just for nothing. He will lay down and that's it. I'm trying to get some things done. And when he's like that, I'm like, what? And we understand each other. Um, yeah, well, it's clear to me, I don't know why people don't see this, but if a dog does a behavior long enough, whether it's two minutes, 20 minutes, or two hours, and you eventually, at the end of that behavior, do what the dog wants, the dog says, great, I got my way. So it's always worth it to the dog to do this as long as it takes to get what they want. They don't have a sense of time. So if your dog is whining or crying, for example, and you eventually go and give the dog attention, give the dog what it wants, the dog just pushes that button every time. You want to correct it. You want to say no and then go away. No, more serious correction if you have to. No, if you have to. So we want, we want to you know, do that correction and then um, if the dog complies, then you can give the dog what they want, but not when they're pushing your buttons to get what they want. Okay, so let's see here. May I post a picture of Chucky? Of course you can. Just go ahead and post it. Uh, let's see here. Uh, I have an approximately 10-year-old Cocker Spaniel that has suddenly decided she hates going in the car. She shakes, paws like crazy. We spend the winters in Florida. Help, please. Vets can't find anything wrong with her, and she's a rescue we've had for seven years. Okay, I can fix this. I can't fix it in a five-minute answer on Skype. But I, I mean, on, on uh, broadcast here on, on Facebook Live, but I can fix it if I come to you for a, a consultation or you can have a Skype uh, consultation or a call. Um, just contact me through the dogcounselor.com. My email address is dean at the dogcounselor.com and I'd be happy to help you with this problem. But it's a problem that happens in stages. And oftentimes when a dog is panicked about the car, we don't even know or see what caused it. It could have happened in a ride somewhere, they could have fallen, hit a bump, some noise outside, a reflection, something going by that, that you know, scared the dog. And then they, they often get locked in there. Hey, hush guys, hush. Um, they, they get locked in their position, so they cannot, um, they cannot get out of it by themselves. Stop, stop, Kirby, stop. Everybody's going crazy because there's somebody at the door. They, they cannot, um, they get, they get stuck. Hey, hush. That's real life, guys, around here. Um, they get stuck in their position. Stop. 
they get stuck in their position and they get locked in on something and they cannot, um, they, hey, hush, okay, enough, thank you. They cannot snap out of it themselves. I would have to show you and, and teach you through training um, uh, how, to, how to correct this. Um, I can fix it, I fix it a lot. I've had a lot of success with it. But um, I can't teach you know exactly how to fix this anxiety problem over a uh, over a broadcast like this. So now let me check some more things we've got here. Let's see here. Uh, um, let's see here. Thank you. I've heard of the thunder shirts. Uh, stop, Kirby. Stop. Uh, yes, uh, a lot of people have uh, talk about the, the thunder shirts. Um, I have seen them work sometimes. Okay. But um, sometimes the, it just depends on the dog. And so every situation is, is different. Kirby, hush, please. Thank you. Kirby's really, really uh, worked up here. Um, they, the Thunder Shirt does work sometimes. But I would say, you know, it's a 50-50 option. Um, I, in milder cases, it works better. Um, you can try it. But I, I feel that it is really tough. To, um, to, to solve an anxiety problem. Kirby, stop, please. It's it, uh, an anxiety problem with... Um, hold on just a second. Kirby, stop. Stop, please. Um, an anxiety problem is a harder thing to solve, okay? So I'm going to have to suggest that you, um, you know, you, you consult me if you want to do a Skype consultation or a phone consultation. I can help you with those issues. Um, I'm going to have to check the time. The time is not coming up on my screen here. So let me check the time over here and see where we're at. Oh my gosh, the time just flies on these broadcasts. I, um, I have five minutes left. I had a whole different intention with this, um, with this broadcast, but um, I can't really, uh, I can't cover it all this time. What I had intended to do when we started today was I was going to sit down and tell you some of my more harrowing uh, dog training stories. Hush, please, hush. I was going to tell you some, Hush, hush, please. I was going to tell you some of my more harrowing dog training stories from my history. I've been doing this over 15 years. And I have a lot of stories that, um, that are about, you know, things that have happened to me, attacks that have happened, vicious dogs I've worked with, some really interesting stories and situations. Um, and so I, uh, I was going to share some of those with you, but I can't... Um, I don't have the time. The time just flies by. I can't believe I've only got five minutes left. But um, I'll share one really cool story with you that I was going to share. Let's see what my time is like. Okay, I've got four minutes. Let me, let me tell you this really cool story. Okay, I, um, I had someone contact me on Facebook, and they said uh, they live in Australia. I mean, I'm sorry, they live in, in New Zealand. Hush, Kirby, please. They live in New Zealand, okay? And so... Um, they are from Iran, and they had a friend in Iran, in Iran that, that needed help with training. And so the, um, the, uh, the person in Iran needed help with training, but in, in Iran, it, there are laws that are really prohibited to dogs. I don't know if you know this or if things have changed since then, but this is a few years ago, but in Iran, um, dog, police can shoot dogs on sight. Uh, the religious leaders consider dogs dirty. And there are, law, there are religious laws against uh, owning a dog in the city. So um, I would, uh, uh, I, they asked if I could help train, but it's illegal <laughs> to uh, go to Iran or to train dogs or to work with dogs or even have dogs. So we created this um, clandestine way of getting on the internet and, and going through a, a backdoor channel because, you know, uh, they really clamped down on the internet there. And I gave dog training lessons to people who run a shelter and work with dogs in Iran. There's one shelter in all of Iran that helps dogs. And so I helped to teach and train via uh, the internet um, to that, uh, to that um, shelter and those people. So I, uh, I uh, hush, 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 Kirby, stop. So that was, that's a fascinating story. And next week, I'm going to just start right off with my stories of training so that I don't get behind like this. Um, the time goes flying by. We are going to broadcast again on Thursday 
Let's see, Sunday, yes, Thursday at 8 o'clock Central Time. Please come back and, uh, and check us out and bring your questions and talk to us. I'd be happy to answer any questions. But I'm going to devote Thursday to my stories about dog training because I have some fascinating ones. And today we got distracted and we got off track and we talked about a bunch of other stuff and people are knocking on the door and the dogs are barking. Sorry about all that, guys, but it's real life. Um, but if you come back Thursday, I'm going to tell you all my fascinating stories about dog training, being attacked, uh, training in Iran, all these different things. In the meantime, if you would, check out my book, A Dog's Way. You can get it on Amazon.com. It's called A Dog's Way, How Dogs Make Us Better People. And I hope you'll check it out. And if you need to contact me, I'm at thedogcounselor.com. Again, thank you to the Wolf Driver and the Wolf Driver channel for letting me be a part of this. I really enjoy it every week. And uh, please contact me when you can. Okay? Good. Have a good week. Bye-bye, guys. Thanks.